The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. And co-hosts, Mike Tussaw from KnowYourOptionsInc.com. And Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express. Don't spend time worrying about your broker. At Options Express, security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit optionsexpress.com slash OX radio to open your free account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Welcome back to the Option Block, and I hope all of our listeners out there are having a fun and indeed a profitable, and given what we're seeing today on the street today, a safe start to the trading week. My name is Mark Longo from the Options Insider. Dot com as well as, of course, the old Options Insider Radio Network. And, of course, I am joined on the old Option Block All-Star panel by a rogues gallery of All-Star contributors today, starting off with the, not the man from the mountains, but the man from Monday. Indeed, Monday Mike, as some of you may know him. <laughs> he is Mike Cavanaugh from Know Your Options, Inc. Mr. Cavanaugh, welcome back to the show, sir. Always good to be back. I've put in a reminder on my calendar from here to eternity that Monday at 3 p.m. I will be on the show. So it's good to be here as and a fixture on the Monday show. <laughs> I don't know if we've locked in till eternity, but we got some more shows coming up, so we'll, we'll see. We'll we'll keep you from in from my on... cold dead hand, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and <laughs> and that laughter is none other than Andrew Givanazzi, the latest addition to the Option Pit team he is indeed the adult supervision he also dishes out the slinkies at the fun event so he's the guy you want to get to know andrew welcome back to the show to you as well We've dished out a lot of slinkies yeah how was both of you guys were out in vegas right Thank so how, how how uh, how was the show uh it was good i don't think it was as well attended as it maybe some in the past but it was it was good for us you know we're the only there people they're talking about option volatility for the most part was so uh, we were definitely a, a lone presence in that in that way, but um, it was uh, it was good for us. So we we're very happy with you know with the turnout and yeah, the people we talked to. Given my experience with with the old uh, money show, if you're in that vendor hall pushing the latest green or red triangle system to tell you when to buy or sell a stock, then of course you got a crowded field to compete with. But if you're talking anything a little bit more elaborate or sophisticated, like indeed options and options volatility, then you kind of have you kind of have the playing field to yourself in in that respect. So it sounds like you guys had had an uncrowded field in that sense, which is good. Did you have a decent turnout at the booth? Yeah, we did. I mean, we gave out a lot of slinkies. I'm still so waiting for definitely, I'm still uh, waiting for my option you know, block maybe we're slinky use the in the slinky mail. indicator for Mark. <laughs> Actually, <I'm> um, <laughs> but I think uh, the slinky indicator they're very just to let anybody know if you want swag at a, a trade show Go to the Slinky with your logo embossed on it. I think it's a good, uh, it's an excellent, uh, it's an excellent uh, traffic generator. So that that's better than Mark Sebastian in his best Booth Babe outfit. <laughs> Was he rocking the shorts, the mini skirt? <laughs> <laughs> that might be a, some, that might be a traffic uh, frightener. We, we did have uh, Mark there and uh, and Anna, our uh, our 
our marketing ace there as well. So they everybody was well turned out. I'll just put it that way. We didn't. We had the right people doing the. Uh, let's just call it the coordination of uniform. So we looked okay. And uh, Mr. Cavanaugh, you went to the expo as, as well, correct? I was there briefly. I was in Vegas for another conference. I stopped by the the expo for a, a brief moment to uh, to watch a couple of the the speakers and you know buzz through the. Uh, the expo hall briefly on Saturday as they were shutting it down. I won't mention names because I love everybody in the trading world. But uh, you know, to names. your point about if you're not selling the next widget or wing ding that's got a green triangle or a blue star, you're really bucking the trend. You know, as a as a retail investor and an advisor who gears his service towards the retail environment, you know, I view it as my objective is to teach people how to manage and assess risk. And that does not sell newspapers. And without mentioning names, somebody in the marketing world told me that I would never have any success and that I'm bucking the current trends if I talk about risk management. I should be talking about how much money people can make. And uh, I wholeheartedly disagreed because my experience has told me if you're not aware of the risk, you may make money in the short term, but long term, if you can't manage and assess risk, you will not have success in the long term. So let me then buck the trend and say, manage your risk. It's not sexy. It doesn't sell wing dings and widgets, but uh, it'll it'll get you where you need to be long term. I don't, yeah, I don't know if that pitch really plays on the uh, on the Money Show Expo Hall floor next to the guy hawking oil wells with the suitcase open full of cash and the booth next to him selling gold coins with the booth paves. There's uh, Mr. Kavanaugh in the middle, the lonely man on the island saying, manage your risk. <laughs> it, it does not sell newspapers Whoa. in the short term, but I'll tell you, what I found happens is... I'll have a conversation with somebody about risk management, and they'll get lured, almost like poor little Frodo Baggins with the ring in the Lord of the Ring movies. They'll get lured by the person telling them how much they can make, and six months later, they call me back and say, I wish I would have listened to you about the, the risk management thing, and it's not about how much money you can make, but it's about assessing and managing risk. So the people that listen, I find, are the ones that uh, tend to do well, and the people that don't, they call me six months later. So in your in your analogy, then you are indeed Gandalf, the wizard of risk management. Battling. We were thinking about changing the name Know Your Options to Gandalf Risk Management. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. You might have some trademark issues See, but with that one. Using some marketing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know. It's they uh, marketing. That's a catch twenty-two. Speaking of Gandalf, one of my worst investments was when I was. I was. I might have been still in high school. I forgot, or just barely into college. And I, I, I picked a uh, a stock based purely on emotional reasons. That the name was Gandalf. It was Gandalf Technologies, or something like that. And it just, it just, it just struck a chord with me. And of course, the thing was a piece of garbage. But I always think of Gandalf with companies now just being a a, a tortured legacy. To, to say the least. All right, with that and with that nice Lord of the Rings analogy in place, we're going to dive right into the trading block. The trading block. And welcome to the trading block. This is, of course, a portion of the show where we discuss what was catching our attention today. What was moving the markets and it was indeed a day of much market movement it's a three m's much market movement <laughs> that'll be our new indicator uh, of course three m might have some trademark disputes with that as well but we saw a lot of red on the screens today most most of the major indices down about two percent the s p closed 1192 down about nearly 23 handles and the dow closed down almost 250 to 11547 and i believe i don't i haven't seen the latest update but throughout the day i believe it was it was negative for the year now at this point i'm not sure if the dow still closed below that but not exactly a uh, a banner day for the dow as well and of course the tech heavy nasdaq down about two percent as well nearly 50 handles to 25 23 and the good old vix cash up ever so slightly up three percent to uh, nearly one handle to 32.91 of course on a day like today you expect to see the vix up a little bit anyway coming off the weekend a little bit of a bump and now of course with today's movement giving a lot more juice to to the old vix 
And Andrew, let's start there then. Let's dive into into the fun that's going on in the VIX. I know we have an interesting scenario right now, which is kind of analogous to one we just saw a few months ago going into the debate over the debt ceiling. And that week, the week leading into that deadline, which was on a Tuesday, uh, we saw just premiums on options across the board were through the roof. So we saw a lot of people being lured to the dark side, hitting bids, inputs, and let's say Ford and a bunch of other names just because they look so juicy with all the debt ceiling premium. But we also saw just a preponderance of people out there emailing us on the site, posting on our forums, calling me, talking to me personally at various events and things that I bump into people in on a regular basis. And everyone and their mother just was loading up to the downside in VIX ahead of that debt ceiling announcement or that debt deadline because they knew one way or the other, they thought anyway, one way or the other, that there would be a deal reached and all that vol would, of course, come off. And, of course, we saw that was indeed the wrong way to play it because the vol just took off to the roof the next couple of days. And then, of course, we had the downgrade on that Friday and the VIX has never looked back so um, i have not heard the same uh, let's say the same opinion the same overall enthusiasm for vix downside going into this deadline are you is that what you're seeing as well or are you seeing people saying i'm going to load up on uh, near-term VIX? yeah i think the the problem is everybody um everybody had uh, decided they knew what the outcome was going to be and you know it's kind of like uh in uh, y2k in 2000 Everybody, everybody had decided that the uh, every computer was going to shut off, the world was going to go dark, and you know they were all getting money out of their ATM machines just because it was all because it was preordained that this was going to happen. So I think the lesson we learn is if everybody thinks it's going to happen, you know that doesn't mean necessarily it's going to happen. And uh, I think at this point, uh, this is something that we've had a recurring theme in. Uh, the option uh, on the pit report that Marksman and I've been going over is the fact that volatility really, um, since we had that, that down spike has been constantly priced in for about the last two, three weeks. Um, and they, the underlying movement has had, it, we've been moving, but it hasn't been enough really to sustain, um, uh, kind of the VIX levels where they are. And, and, and nobody's really ready to hit the bit. So it kind of sits there. It's what I call kind of fatigue. It happens. It sits there. And nobody's really ready to make a move this time. And I really think the market is not going to get caught caught this time. Uh, they're like, we're ready. And, okay, once they decide that uh, some debt deal is going to happen, then we'll take it down, but we're not going to hit it beforehand. And I think really that's what's happening right now. The, the people that sold that juice the first time, they all got taken to the hoop, and they're not going to do it a second time. That's, that's yeah, you know, that's all. That was always the those are always the scenarios when I was on the floor that made me the most nervous when I saw a, just a almost uniformity of opinion across the board that one event was going to play out one way or the other. It usually, it usually didn't come to pass that way. I think my favorite example is always Lucent. I can't imagine back in the dot com meltdown when everyone thought Lucent at sixty three was the buy of the century, and uh, that was that one didn't turn out too well either. Of course, the old Enron twenty puts. I heard quite a few, I got a, quite a few calls on those as well when Enron broke 20 that those were the sale of the century and that one didn't work out too well exactly. either yeah vix right now vix isn't in a weird place right now because you're right we're at these elevated levels for vix and people may not think 33 which we're close today roughly is elevated given our new frame of reference but historically that's a very high level for vix and of course that requires that necessitates an extreme movement in the S&P on a daily basis to maintain that level. And we're even a day like today is, is not even enough to maintain that level over the long term. We need d today plus every day going forward to keep to justify these VIX levels. And I don't think anyone really thinks that's going to happen. So this has to come off. But you're right in the near term. Anything could happen, so no one is ready to pull that pull that trigger and try to take some VIX, take the VIX down a little bit. They really are just uh, holding their breath and waiting and seeing. So I think for the near term, this is an unjustifiable level, but when it will actually come in is uh, is anyone's guess. Yeah, every time I hear you know somebody says, "Oh, this is a sure thing," I just kind of smile, and you know I know that the only sure thing in options trading is that there is no sure thing. You know, I remember about 11 years ago, it was the uh, George Bush Al Gore election. I had this guy convinced that selling a straddle on the SPX, I'm sorry, buying a straddle on the SPX was by far the best thing to do. If Al Gore gets elected, the market goes down. If George Bush gets elected, the market goes up and it's going to move higher because or it's going to move higher than the price of the straddle because the straddle was so cheaply underpriced. 
Uh, and we all know how the election turned out. This guy was long premium into what should have happened is the market would have gone up or down based on the cheap premium. And then they delayed the election with the hanging chads. So this guy ate all the premium and it got dragged out for a month. So the the only sure thing is there is no sure thing. So when you see people betting on, oh, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, I always scratch my head. And this is another case with the with the VIX, like if, Andrew was that describing. We vacillated enough, I would think, during that period, though, that if he was uh, if he was a gamma scalping type, he would have done all right with that straddle, I would imagine, because we that was a pretty crazy period to be on the floor actively trading. We were we were up and down every other day based on some nonsense rumor coming out of Florida, of course. So I would think maybe, of course, uh, you guys aren't out there. It's difficult to scalp gamma for a lot of your clients on a regular basis. But I would think if you were if you were long that straddle and managed to hit a few gamma scalps here and there, you could have. You could have you could have weathered the storm, I think, at the very least. Maybe maybe not. I had to go back and look, but an interesting period nonetheless to be uh, to be long some premium. Of course, the uh, the big driver today, what we just alluded to earlier, was of course the concerns that the super committee will not get the job do- job done. The perhaps not so aptly named super committee. You have to love our government. They can't get a deal done within the first deadline. So they say, hey, let's just make a new deadline (laughs) and we'll make it next time, of course, because that's a deadline. We have to do it by then. So let's just skip this deadline and push it down the road to the next deadline and then we'll get it all done by then. So, of course, everyone in D.C. scrambling right now to uh, to figure out what the heck they're going to do before the the deadline looms. And refresh my memory. Is the deadline Wednesday? What's the which day is the deadline again this week? I thought, yeah, Wednesday, right? That's the deadline for the super lame committee. Yes. At least they gave us the setup. They put super in the front. <clears throat> yeah, you know, it reminds me of just Patriot Act, these Orwellian slash uh, ironic names of, uh, of, of things down there, the, the super committee. Like, like, anyone, but, like anyone in Congress is really equipped to, to deal with these issues, the macroeconomic issues facing us right now. We have a bunch of lawyers looking to fix our economy, usually a, a, not exactly a recipe for success but yeah anything else uh of course we have apple of course dipping below the 375 handle again talked quite a bit about apple on the last show so we don't have to dive into that again unless you guys really want to anything else really caught you guys caught your eyes today in today's activity mike or andrew Uh, i mean nothing in particular for me my only problem now is just talking with people about size i it's one of these things where everything market looks cheap while totally looks relatively high and you kind of want to strap stuff on i think to a degree but it's still so nutty. That's my only thing trading wise is I just reduce size in this kind of environment. It's hard to get excited about anything because it's, it's such kind of this binomial marketplace. You know, if you're right, you're going to look like a super genius. But if not, we'll just go with the super committee thing and just say it'll be super lame for you. It's just a very unforgiving environment overall. So. There's nothing really special uh, as far as is anything really sticking out as fantastic. We're just we're really trying to sort of surgically strike so a couple of ideas, but that's basically you know at least my take on it from our from what we were talking about today at Option Pit. All right, that is going to do it for the old trading block today, and now we're going to roll right into the odd block. The odd the block. block. All right, and welcome to the Odd Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we break down the interesting and or the unusual options activity that's lighting up the tape today. Well, I, I suppose interesting is a subjective term, so maybe uh, we'll let our listeners decide whether our, our, our picks are interesting, but we try. We try to make them interesting. We'll kick things off in the Odd Block today with a newcomer. We like to do that here in the old Odd Block, and it's... It's either Gilead or Gilead Sciences, Inc. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that. Ticker symbol G-I-L-D, Guild. I like that. Gilead. Did, Definitely did, Gilead. I think it's Gilead. All right. And uh, this is a uh, hepatitis C drug developer. Oh, I'm sorry. Gilead today announced that they are purchasing a hepatitis, hepatitis C drug developer, Pharmaset. And so this could deal, only only $11 million deal. So in the grand scheme of things, not exactly the largest deal. But uh, in, in a surprising bit of frankness from the company, they announced that this deal 
could weigh down their earnings for quite some time to come. In fact, they said about three years, which, of course, in the what have you done for me lately world of the market, that's an eternity. And so the stock got hit pretty good today, down a little almost 10 percent today, closed at thirty six dollars and twenty six cents down about three three sixty two three dollars sixty two cents or so it was down as low as thirty four forty five during intraday so it it rallied a little bit towards the end of the day and that people thinking that this sentiment was overdone was the resounding amount of the activity we saw today actually we saw and this is let's just set the stage here this is the name that does about seven thousand contracts a day which is a decent amount of activity for this name and they did nearly fifty thousand today so a lot of people diving into gilead today and what we saw in the options pretty much echo the sentiment we saw towards the end of the day in the stocks that maybe this sell-off was a wee bit overdone. We saw a lot of long call spreads pick, being scooped up here on Gilead. The, probably the two most sizable ones were the, both in uh, both in January. We saw the Jan 36.39 call spread going up a thousand times for about a, for a buck 23. And then we saw a one by two going up on the Jan 3841 call spread. Went up 1100 by 2200 times for 48 cents. So both of these guys looking at a uh, a near term or relatively near term pop to the upside here in Gilead. Not 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 too far up because obviously they think the stock is still this deal is still going to weigh on the earnings. But they're thinking that this is way overdone. This thing's going to pop. They gave themselves a nice bit of breathing room here by rolling out to. January instead of December. So overall, I think this is an interesting trade. I don't know if I agree with the sentiment behind it, but if I'm going to going to structure it, I like perhaps the one by two a little bit better. Uh, I know Andrew, you're a big fan of one by twos. In fact, I think we're going to discuss them a little bit later on in the show. But uh, do you, do you guys either you two watch this one at all or have any uh, any sentiment on these trades? No, but I but I agree with you. That I like I they seem to be structured better than a lot of, you know, this is on the upper end of the structure scale for some of the stuff we've seen here. <laughs> yeah. For, for the odd block paper, this is, uh, even any simple vertical is, is a, is a, uh, is a dramatic leap up in terms of savvy. And <laughs> right. it might be odd, but it's not as ugly. Let's just put it that way. Exactly. Exactly. It's not just coming in and gobbling up 80,000 upside lottery tickets as we, as we've seen on a few of these ones. So yes, the moral of the story is a lot of near-term bullish sentiment here in good old Gilead, or I'm sorry, Gilead, that, um, that's our consensus, I believe, Gilead, <laughs> that this this sell-off is overdone and that this thing's going to pop sometime in the next few months. And they're going to move on to another size market mover here and a newcomer to the odd block, good old NII Holdings, ticker symbol NIHD. They closed today at 22.70, down about 71 cents or 3%. This is the name that does about 2,800 contracts a day. They did a little over 4,000 today. So it wasn't an explosion of activity, but for, for this name, it was relatively sizable. And what we saw was essentially one player coming in and look, taking a not too favorable look at or not too favorable viewpoint here on the stock he picked up 3000 which is a sizable trade for uh, NIHD that's the entire ADV in one in one scoop he picked up 3000 of the D21 puts he picked them up for 65 cents this is a strike that has a previous open interest of just 175 contracts so a sizable amount of opening paper here in NIHD. Again, this could be multiple viewpoints. This could be someone, obviously, who is an underlying holder who just wants to uh, protect himself on the near term in uh, on the DS21 strike. Of course, that's a relatively close position for. If he is an underlying holder, he's paying a lot of decay by doing that. But perhaps he has some very near-term concerns that this one's going to take a take a dive before the end of the year. Regardless, a uh, not exactly a bullish sentiment here for NIHD. You guys have anything to add on this one? No, I mean, that's basically what it does look like. I mean, it's a short-term risk management play. I mean, if somebody's speculating on that short of a, of a time period that it's going to go down, that seems like an awfully large bet for a, a four-week play. I mean, you're a, you're a money manager. You're an asset manager. You're an advisor, Mike. So what... 
if you were a long underlying holder, you'd have to have something pretty dire, I would think, on your radar to want to load up on these DS twenty ones here and not at least roll out to let's say March or uh, or or some mid year of next year and give yourself a little bit of little bit of extra wiggle room here. Well, I mean, you'd you'd have to have an unbelievably large portfolio. You know, if if that's if it's one investor, you're looking at a concentration of a stock. You know, three thousand put options is three hundred thousand shares of the stock. The stock's trading at twenty two. That's six million bucks. Um, if that's one percent of your portfolio, then hey, great. If you've got a short term concern, I have a, a creeping suspicion that it's not one percent of somebody's portfolio. Other than just a huge concentration and maybe not really affecting the best hedge, somebody must have a very, very short-term speculative reason that the market's going down. And if it is a large concentration in an individual stock, it, it would seem there would be other ways to uh, to hedge it. You know, by laddering the puts over time. You know, selling some calls to help finance the purchase of the puts. Yeah, there's some juicy uh, collar opportunities here if this guy wanted to uh, to offset some of his premium here. I mean, you can actually you can actually leg into very easily a no cost collar, which I know is your uh, is your juicy mo over at KYO. You can just do the yeah. DS D- 21 24 collar for essentially for essentially even money. I- exactly. So to me, you know, I always kind of scratch my head. I wonder if there's a guy writing a newsletter that has. 3,000 people that all agreed to buy a one lot and package it together. I mean, that's almost what it seems like. <laughs> that would be about the level of sophistication I would expect for for something like this. So, yeah, not exactly. This is probably, this is a, uh, this one falls relatively low on the savvy slash sophistication meter for the old odd block. It certainly isn't in the league of even a one by two ratio vertical call spread. This is just a... Uh, this is just, I'd say maybe, on, what, what do we say, the, the Andrew, Sav, oh, it was the Givenazzi Savvy Scale? That's savvy what it was. Scale? Savviness. Yeah, I think this is below five. <laughs> yeah, we're this below, is a, this is a three, I think. Right, we're, we're below. Of course, now the stock goes to three dollars. <laughs> exactly. This, this, guy, <laughs> this guy looks like a genius. <laughs> How does he know? Then I want to meet him, and I want to ask him what he's going to buy his next 3,000 puts exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> maybe. That's, How did he know? How maybe did he know? this is uh, obviously a senator or a congressman here. We, uh, we talked earlier about that. Uh, about maybe that. this is just an honest graft trade. Yeah, just some old guy from the Senate Finance Committee. You know, they're going to change some communications hey, rules. this guy's office tomorrow to shut it down. <laughs> so maybe a few thousand puts. Just just something small. Just Get to, the ball rolling. Exactly, just to try it out. All right, so that is going to do it for the old odd block. And now we're going to roll right into the strategy block. The strategy block. And welcome to the strategy block. This is usually the portion of the show where Uncle Mike Tussaw comes down for the mountains and we discuss some trading tip or trick or technique or general option strategy in more detail. But it is, of course, Monday, so it is a Monday mic day, and we're actually going to do, we're going to switch it up even more, and we're going to have good old Andrew from Option Pit, of Option Pit fame, <laughs> uh, diving in to discuss some interesting trades and ideas of what they're looking at over here on VIX. We, of course, touched on at the top of the show the odd state that VIX is in right now, hovering at these elevated levels. A lot of people do want to get short the VIX in some way, shape, or form, but it is a difficult proposition to really, and you want to do it in a little more, I think, savvy of a, of a manner than just, or you want to do it in a little more sophisticated of a manner than just coming in and loading up on VIX downside. You want to, I think, you want to, you want to construct it in a little bit different fashion because we, as we discussed, we saw what happened last time and that wasn't exactly the, uh, the winning trade of the year, let's say. Right. So, Andrew, and wanna, you guys, I know you guys wanna, over at maybe. Option Pit have been uh, have been discussing this in some detail. So, why don't you uh, enlighten us on what you guys have been talking about over there? So, uh, we're t- maybe it's the concept of getting uh, shorted without being, you know, shorted at the kind of the current level. So, there's developed some wiggle room in the in in the in the trade. So. A couple ways to do that, or right, one way was in the VXX, kind of buying an out-of-the-money put spread like D-Snow um, below the strike. Uh, one way to do that, you're exposed to some 
uh, VXX Vega in that, but uh, you, that would be made up for by the fact that the name could come down. So that could be a you know one two short short term trade. Uh, another one was just using the skew really on the upside of the VIX to put on a one by two for credit. You're not going to be massively. You're not going to get that real big short bang if the VIX collapses, but you'll get some room in case you get the spike as well. You know, you, you structure it uh, kind of the at the money to some out of the money strikes. So in case we do get a further pop, you know, you have some room and you don't have to scramble uh, as much. And if VIX just collapses, just the spread takes care of itself. So, I mean, those are two kind of the ideas of, of, of trying to sell the the VIX right now or sell if sell the fact that it could be, you know sell it as in going down without sort of uh, overloading the boat too much on on risk so those are you know again a couple of things guys have been doing on they've been working out and you know those are the types of trades again uh, always mindful of uh, position size when you're doing stuff like that but you know those are the ideas uh, we've been having yeah, you know, the old VIX, like I said, it is a uh, interesting beast. And you mentioned, you, I be, you believe you said it was Novadis, uh, a little bit downside, uh, diagonal. And the VXX, spread. right. Yeah, and the VXX. Just close to the VIX, but uh, those the weighted contracts and the ETN. Is that your preferred weapon of choice for VIX these days? No, I think it really is dependent on what's going on in either one. You know, how the futures are structured, whether the VXX looks a little better or not than the regular VIX. They, I mean, they're, they price very similar, obviously, but... I mean, some sometimes uh, one contract's a little easier for other people to digest than the other contract. So it might be a good a good discussion point as well because we have had uh, some inquiries and emails and questions about that in the past about which VIX product of the Legion that are out there we is our preferred go to weapon of choice. And I and I pick I don't trade the VIX that much, but when I do, I usually tend to uh, stick with the plain vanilla VIX options. It's just easier and simpler to uh, incorporate into what I'm doing on a regular basis. Like I said, I don't, I don't usually have time to go in and uh, and uh, maybe ratio v- VIX versus VXX or some of these other ones that are out there. But, you know, there are, all, of course, there's legions of ETNs and everything else out there as well. But, yeah, I usually tend to uh, play in and around the VIX options and with the VIX futures on occasion. And, Andrew, sounds like you mix and match as well, depending on the occasion. Right. And, you know, exactly. And the way uh, the term structure and the futures are set up, sometimes the VXX is sort of self-consuming. Other times it's not. You know, all those things kind of come into play when we look at that stuff. So, I think we could repen Mark Longo's title as the most interesting options trader in the world. I don't always trade volatility, but when I do, I trade the fix. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that, I was, kind of, I, that was, that was in very the line of the most interesting options trader in the world, Mr. Longo, I tend to agree with you. You know, I, I see so many people, and this isn't Andrew or his clients, but I see in the retail world, I see so many people trying to get exposure to the VIX through the VXX, and I don't think they get it. I don't think they understand all the, the moving parts of the VIX, and then to jump into an ETN on the VIX – um, I see a lot of people buy and holding the, the VXX without understanding that there's a natural path dependence that these things go down with time. And, um, you know, I, I kind of try to move people to trade the volatility on what you're trying to hedge versus, you know, an overall volatility play in the VIX. Because if you're not sophisticated, a good place to start is get down on the horn with Andrew and uh, Mark Sebastian over at the Option Pit to kind of learn the intricacies of trading volatility on volatility. There, there's a lot going on. Right. I agree. Yeah, you definitely have to understand how those products work. And the, the, the it's funny to say this, actually, but the VIX is really the most vanilla of, <laughs> of all these uh, all these volatility products. It's it's the easiest one to understand, you know, if, if that's possible even to yeah, say. Yeah, this whole universe <laughs> has cropped up now, this under-levered and over-levered uh, ETNs floating or NETFs floating around out there that are just... Uh, it can be extremely confusing for uh, the first right. person first Get, wetting their whistle on volatility trading. Right. Gets it does. It does. Of course, that being said, you know, I still tend to nine times out of 10, I'm looking at vol. I, I tend to dive into the SPX or SPY a little more often than I do. I don't do straight up VIX that often. Like I said, I'm, I think you probably fall into the same camp, Uncle Mike, where uh, if you're looking at something to go on or you want some downside and against, let's say, adverse movements in the S&P. I still tend to lean against at the pure product itself as opposed to uh, the volatility offshoot. Is that the way? I'm sure you've fallen on that camp as well. 
Yeah, I mean, vanilla, I, I'll call it apples. You know, we, we hedge apples with apples. Maybe we're not smart enough or we don't use value at risk models to uh, deal with perceived risk. You know, we, if, if we have the opportunity to hedge an underlying with the put or call on the underlying, we'll tend to lean towards hedging apples with apples. Yeah, I look back over the years and it, it sounds so slick and so smart about VAR models, value at risk models and perceived risk that it it almost lures you into the perception of the probabilities are played in your favor to do this and, and you lure yourself into this, well, I didn't think that was going to happen and it did and then your value at risk model that said you'd only be down $400 if the market was down 18% uh, and the market's down 22% and you're down $650,000. Because I guess well your your value at risk model didn't take that into uh, into effect because it never happened before and who could have predicted this happening I mean this is crazy so yes in a in a long winded answer we tend to stay vanilla with the uh, hedging apples with apples <laughs> long winded from Monday Mike I, I never would have expected that from you sir. <laughs> I have a propensity to ramble <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> Yes. I think staying clean with a hedge is certainly the the easiest way to go. So I'll I'll just agree very shortly like that. But <laughs> Andrew, Mr. Succinct as always. <laughs> All right, that is going to do it for the old strategy block today and now we're going to roll right into around the block. Around the block. And welcome to Around the Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we discuss what's coming up on the horizon, what's dominating our trading screens for the next few sessions. And uh, it really, we're all pretty much on the same boat here and that we're all watching DC. Our focus has shifted from the old Eurozone back across the pond to DC. And we're all watching what this quote unquote super committee can do or what they can't do and what their outcome of their debate is. Of course, we have the deadline looming on Wednesday, and that's pretty much going to dominate everything else that's going on. There's no other earnings or economic announcements that really can rival this one. And we've discussed a little bit earlier in the strategy block some ways to potentially position for this in terms of if you think or if you do have a bias that you think VIX is going to come off, then we discussed a little bit about that in the old strategy block. Of course, there are a number of other ways to pr prep ahead of this. I'm sure Monday, Mike, you guys, have you guys tightened up your collars nicely ahead of the announcement on Wednesday or what's the, uh, what's the MO going forward for Wednesday over at KYO? Well, we had the uh, expiration come around, so our November calls expired worthless. Uh, we didn't jump in and recollar anything today just because we don't like selling calls on down days. So we're we're still long our puts. We haven't uh, we haven't moved the puts around and uh, we're waiting for an update. So right now, I mean, basically on the indices, we're in a married put position waiting for any kind of a rally to start selling some calls against it. If the rally doesn't come, then we'll have to uh, sell the puts and then uh, recollar. So our position says we're bullish. Our sentiment says... We hope we're right. It, it basically, we didn't sell the calls on December yet because we didn't want to box ourselves in on a down day. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably have that same sentiment. They're looking for a position or an opportunity to leg into their collar, and today it's just not exactly the ideal day <laughs> for uh, for that. Yeah, we're expecting expecting the worst and hoping for the best. <laughs> and uh, of course, we touched a little bit on the on the last time you were on about Apple. And I had we had Uncle Mike on the last show, who of course is the diehard Apple bull amongst you, and he even seems to be uh, conciliating on that point and starting to say, well, maybe the the best of times are behind Apple. Of course, Apple today did break through that 375 magic mark again, closed at 369, almost even today. So, have you guys readjusted at all? Are you planning to readjust? You think going into expiration and out of expiration on Apple, or have you decided that the that the best you have, well you have you have no no 400 put right so you have to readjust by the end of after the end of the week we haven't had our uh, apple death talk yet um, we're still in the uh, like you said the no i'm sorry these puts uh, we haven't put any calls on yet we're looking for a uh, any kind of shot for this thing to come back up otherwise we're, we're scheduled to have our death to the golden apple portfolio here in the next week Interesting. The uh, the diehard bulls may be out of. Well, Apple you know what's amazing the, uh, is by the is, end of the week. Are they now just going to trade for cash? 
What, what's that point where Apple just trades for cash? Like what, 85, 90 bucks a share, something like that? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's probably their uh, that's their support on the downside is their uh, their cash value. <laughs> of course, you look you look at it today. They're moving like pretty much just like a regular high beta stock. You know, they're just moving in lockstep with the market today. So we'll see if that keeps up and they just become another one of these uh, high beta ones where you can just uh, they just vacillate with the market and they don't move to the beat of their own drummer as Apple has done for so many years, at least for the most recently for the last few years, where they've just uh, outperformed everything on the planet. But yeah, not too much aside from the Super Committee really to watch and to see. Of course, we'll be watching to see if anyone has any of these positions we've discussed earlier, how they perform coming after uh, after the deadline. Of course, there's concerns that if the Super Committee does drag on and does indeed fail to make a compromise, we could have additional downgrades. We could, so we could actually see a scenario unfolding, which is very similar to what we saw a few months ago, where a downgrade follows the deadline and volatility just goes off to the races again. So if you are prepping to the downside or if you are indeed taking those one by twos that andrew was discussing you maybe want to have a maybe a far far out of the money uh unit to back that up just in case just in case we do have that downgrade explosion of course i'm sh- those one by twos depending on how you structure them you have some decent protection or you have some wiggle room to the upside but uh in being net short units to the upside in vix right now may be a, uh, a an interesting proposition let's just say Given how everything unfolds on I Wednesday, think it's probably well, that risk. Is, oh, good. It is there is risk there for sure. Yeah, I was I was a little surprised to hear you recommend that. Given I know how uh, how conservative you tend to be at times to have uh, to have net short units to the upside in VIX right now is a uh, is playing with fire, yes, sir. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not regretting it, but small small is still the key. <laughs> there you go. Mitigate your risk with size. That should be the option pit logo. Or the sub subtitle. <laughs> All right, that is going to do it for this episode of the Option Block. I want to thank all of my partners in crime for joining me on the show today. Starting off with you, Mr. Slinky, aka Andrew from Option Pits. And what is going on? Of course, you guys are back from the big show in uh, Vegas. But what else is going on at Option Pit? And of course, let our listeners know if they can find uh, your seminars from the Vegas Expo online. Yeah, we are. We're we're going to post them. We'll give you some more information about that. Uh, we are doing another seminar, December 3rd, I believe, on Saturday for the VIX with the CBOE and uh, the Streets uh, Options Profits. So those are the next two events coming up. All right, look for those, and you can, of course, find them on the Option Pit website. Just click on the Events tab. You should be able to find all the upcoming stuff that you guys have going on, and maybe you can fill out a form to get a Slinky, too. I don't know, but no promises there. Not many Slinkies left. <laughs> Play your cards right. Oh, they, they got gobbled up, huh? That's a, a popular tchotchke. Interesting, interesting. Speaking of tchotchkes, Monday Mike, what's going on in the land of Know Your Options, Inc., sir? And I did not mean to imply that you are a tchotchke. I am not. I didn't feel that you implied I was a tchotchke. Just uh, same old, same old. You know, we're Just that you along. love your trade shows. We, uh, our Lunch and Learn program has had some great success. We've had some clients come in the office. Uh, we give them a two-hour presentation on our thoughts for risk management and current market environments. And uh, if we're lucky enough to uh, to get some time down on the exchange, we uh, we take them down to either the uh, the CME floor or the CBO floor. And, uh, you know, it's an open invitation. If you want to come into the office, give us 24 hours notice. Let us uh, let us schedule uh, the appropriate time to put a presentation in, in, in front of you and uh, take you down to the exchange. We were down there last Thursday for expiration and things were hopping in the SPX pit. And it was uh, it's kind of neat to see a little life on the floor. But uh, our lunch and learn program is, is definitely worth uh, stopping down in the office and uh, coming in and meeting the guys. Yeah, just be sure you stay around the SPX and the VIX pits. So if you start wandering too far afield from those, that that sense of life may fall away yes, pretty sir. fast. Yes, sir. I mean, you definitely you go through what appears to be a desert, which is about 75% of the floor, and then you finally get back to where the action is. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I was down there recently, uh, and I saw my old... My old pit outside of SPX was uh, Intel, and it's just completely dismantled. There's not even any, not even any screens there anymore. They used to have some guys out there, a couple in the DPM, and a couple guys streaming, but that was it. And now that's that's all gone as well. So that's really, uh, it's really shifted. If you're not in the VIX or in the S or a few other big index products, there's not much left for you down there on the old floor. All right, and with that happy note, we're going to close out today's episode 
of the option block. Of course, we're not going to be recording on Thursday because that is a holiday here in the States, Thanksgiving. So we won't be around to pontificate on the on the developments that unfold from the super committee. So we'll have to do it next week. So I hope all of our listeners out there have a fun and a safe holiday. And of course they are indeed hedged. If you are short, the old one by short net units and VIX to the upside, then, then, uh, then keep an eye on what's going on with the super committee and maybe have some, pick up some net units far off to the upside. Just, just, to, just in case, or just, just in case, if you, yeah. if you're, if you're worried, I have to, I have to admit a oh, little bit. Good. It sounds like they just, we, we think they're going to fail. So, I don't know. I can't believe the news is out, but that's kind of how we how I look at it. But <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that is going to do it for this episode. Of course, have a safe and happy holiday if you live here in the states, and if not, you can be envious of all of us taking the day off and being gluttons on turkey. <laughs> and we'll see you next week right here on the Option Block. Become a part of the Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved. Presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.